Sixers, and they get inside. Oh, unbelievable. Julia Servic. Fantastic move by the doctor. Julius in the air, palming it with the right hand. Floating, reaching, and spinning. Contact from Jermaine O'Neal. Got a piece of it. Oh! Hubo un tiempo en el que la historia se contaba de boca en boca y las historias que llegaban a la generación siguiente se llamaban leyendas. Y según pasaba el tiempo, crecían y crecían. Hoy en día, la palabra leyenda se usa demasiado. Y en el mundo en el que vivimos, en el que la historia queda grabada de todas las maneras que se puedan imaginar, estas no pueden existir de cualquier forma. Pero si buscas bien, todavía puedes encontrarlas ahí. Quizás sea la última de este tipo. So there's a rumor out there that you can still dunk. Who's spreading the rumor? Me? <laughs> A no ser que tengas una entrada que lo demuestre, probablemente no hayas visto a Julius Erving cambiar el juego del baloncesto. Necesitas a alguien que te cuente lo grande que era el Dr. J. La leyenda es increíble. La historia real es incluso mejor. We always looked at Dr. J as like an alien. He was the coming of a new age. Julius truly was a legend. But the entertainment, my friend, is in the style. Who are you? Uh... <laughs> are you someone important that we should know about? Uh, I used to play professional basketball. Oh, did you? Well, you are pretty tall. Yeah. Really I'm tall. actually <laughs> leaning right now. I don't think you're going to have to do that. Uh, I played for the Nets when they were in Long Island and 76ers. And a defunct team called the Virginia Squires. My name's Julius Erving. Julius Erving? That's yeah. you? It's not you. Are you Julius Erving, really? <laughs> Are you really? Well, it's not Julius Irvin, really. It's just Julius Irvin. <laughs> yes. Really? Yes. <laughs> really? I haven't even heard of you. How are you? It has been a long time since coming back. It's still home. Long Island's always going to be my home. This is Campbell Park right here. Under the water tower. Campbell Park. It's birthplace of basketball for Julius Irving. I had a window in my bedroom that would look across at the park, and I could look out here and see all the kids playing, especially on the weekends. Building's gone, but the essence of it is still there in my mind. Julius Winfield Irving II nació el 22 de febrero de 1950 en Long Island. Era el hijo mediano de Collie y Julius Senior. Sus padres se divorciaron cuando Julius tenía tres años y seis años después, su padre murió en un accidente de tráfico. Cully y sus tres hijos vivieron bajo un proyecto de acogida y el trabajo más importante de Julius fue cuidar de su hermano pequeño Marvin. Marvin fue smart, muy uh, book smart, pero, you know, he was the one who always got sick. He had asthma, he always break out with rashes. That made me more protective, uh, you know, subbing in for the father's role and, you know, being more than a big brother. He was a little bookworm, but he was cool. 
he was, uh, he, he looked up to Junior. He was a great little brother to have. I have great memories of him riding on the handlebars of my bike, because we were very adventurous. We would take a drop line and fish in the lake and fish for sunfish and, uh, and bring them home and mom would cook them up. Pero no hay duda de cuál era el lugar favorito de los dos hermanos para jugar. Justo nada más abrir la puerta. Campbell Park was a special place for me. We probably went there every day. I mean, even when it snowed or rained, if it snowed, you shovel snow and you play basketball. Pero una mañana hacía demasiado frío para Julius y su hermano Archie. Cogieron sus bicis y buscaron un lugar donde jugar a cubierto. I was practicing with the basketball team back in 1962. Somebody came in and said, down, there are two young men that would like to speak to you. So I went outside and we said, Julius Serving and Archie Rogers. They're both age 12. And they asked me if they could play uh, basketball here at the Salvation Army. And uh, at the time, uh, this area was all white. Nobody on the team but me and Julius was African American. But we were children, and we didn't feel the racism. Archie and I, two black kids and 10 white kids, and we became a team. Cuando Julius tenía 13 años, su madre trasladó a la familia a una casa. Jugó en el colegio Roosevelt y gracias a su mejor amigo en el equipo, consiguió algo que permanecería junto a él para el resto de su vida. On the court, I made a point to know all the rules. <laughs> And so, you know, you walk, you depart, you know, I was ready to make a call. If you ball went out off his leg, he'd always make an excuse. You know, you push me, you grab me, you hold on my jersey. I mean, he was like a professor, you know, weighing you down in the lecture hall. So I started calling him professor. I said, well, what do you know? I mean, you're here arguing me. I mean, what are you, like the, the, the doctor? And every time we would see each other, you know, I'd look up to him and I'd say, doctor, professor. And it was just an inside joke. Por entonces, todo el mundo decía que era una joya en la pista. Pero no era alguien muy adecuado para cruzarse con él y encontrártelo en el camino. I remember one time it was a fast break and he was in the front of the break and he stopped to pull up to wait for the rest of us to get down court. And coach just got up and screamed at him. What are you doing? Bust him. En su año senior, Julius solo medía 1.90. Se había convertido en uno de los mejores jugadores del equipo, pero estaba marcado por estar en un pequeño colegio. Solo un ojeador fue a verle jugar. Here's Julius after I saw him play, and I rated him a four, which isn't bad, you know. But don't forget, now I'm rating him here as a six, three and a half forward guard. That's not a bad rating because he had no rating. No one thought he was going to be that good. No one knew he was alive as a player. Pero en el playground, Julius era un jugador completamente diferente. Everything always went well at the park, especially if you would do things that were a little different than the things that the other kids were doing. I had a lot of tricky stuff around the basket, putting it up left-handed, right-handed, jumping over people. Y una tarde en el asfalto, el secreto de Julius Erving salió a la luz por primera vez. He didn't know that I was there, and Julius is coming out on a fast break. And he was at the foul line. And Julius goes up in the air. I closed my eyes because I thought he wasn't going to be able to go that far in the air. But he just collided. Then he dunked on me. That was beyond my imagination. And he acted like it was no big deal. El entrenador Wilson había visto suficiente. Llamó a un amigo suyo, que resultó ser el entrenador de la Universidad de Massachusetts. Y después del siguiente paso por dicha universidad, otros empezaron a maravillarse del freshman que parecía que podía volar. A lot of the kids got a chance to start watching him. And they saw what I saw. Julius was a 6'3 jumper. They jumped like he was 7 foot. That was the buzz that went around the school. I had a frequent caller 
who bombarded me with propaganda about this freshman basketball player at the University of Massachusetts named, quote, Julie Irving. Su carrera en el baloncesto empezaba a despuntar, a la vez que la conexión con su familia se mantenía fuerte. That February, Marvin came up on my birthday. We spent time on campus, in the dorm, and he was complaining about pain in his joints and had a rash. They go home and he's in the hospital. You know, the doctors were running tests. My mindset is, they're gonna get to the bottom of it, it's gonna be treatable, and then he'll be all right. Los médicos le diagnosticaron lupus y después de tres meses su situación empeoró. My mom calls me and she says, uh, you need to come back home. He said, Lee, uh, I just got a call from mom and mom is not doing good and they don't know if he's going to make it through the night. You know, I got to go home. I said, hey man, let's, let's go. I'll, I'll drive. He was just quiet. He just was thinking about his brother. The trip was generally a three plus hour trip, but we did it in under two. We flew. And he, you know, literally jumped out the car and was running up the stairs. His mother was in the room and, uh, you know, I heard his mother scream. I just, just cry out. He said, I'm really tired. And, uh, you know, they need to come and get me. And he's talking about the angels. And that was the last thing he said to me. I mean, I go back and, you know, everybody's there at the house. And uh, I just go to our room because I got to be by myself. The things we had done, those journeys to the park, bicycle rides, I mean, all of those things were not going to happen again. And the finality of that It's overwhelming. It just seems so unfair. Sometimes when I dream, I dream about living in the attic with my brother. So this place has come back to me many, many times, and now I'm back at it. in this bedroom with Marvin. We spent a lot of time planning for the future, but he's always going to be 16, you know? Man plans and God laughs. When I went back to school after his funeral, All I could do is take a spirit with me. So when I line up against an opponent who is only thinking of being one, you know, now I got two spirits in there. I got mine, I got my brothers. I have a slight advantage. En su año junior, Julius había crecido hasta los dos metros y promediaba 27 puntos y 20 rebotes por partido. Pero las reglas perjudicaron su juego porque en aquel momento en la liga universitaria estaba prohibido machacar. Tuvo que adaptarse a ello en el playground y una vez que empezó la temporada, era el más famoso de todo el campus. Desde que en los años 50 el Rucker Park en Harlem albergara los torneos de verano, a los que acudieron hombres como Will Chamberlain o Connie Hawkins, entre los más importantes de los jugadores de color, se empezó a jugar un baloncesto en el que el espectáculo era tan importante como el resultado. The first game you got in on this court here. And played like a bum, you was a bum. 
So when Jerry Sherman came to Rucker, he needed to be known in the basketball world as a great player, or he would have probably figured out a way to deal with his books and keep his grades high. We played him the first game, and they kept saying, you wait till Julius gets here. You wait till Julius, and I'm like, who's Julius? <laughs> I'm in the NBA, but I care about Julius. Tom Hoover no sabía nada de él, pero enseguida el chaval llamado Julius estaba haciendo cosas que nadie en Rucker ha podido olvidar. At the baseline, he dumps, and the guy takes the ball out to throw it the length of the court for a fast break. He jumps up in the air and catches the ball and throws it down. Charlie Scott shot a long shot, and Julius came, took it out of the air, and dumped it. That took it right there. I said, I don't, I don't need to see anything else. This was it. People here in Harlem, they really know good basketball. And, uh, you know, if you, if you do something real nice, you know, they show their appreciation. He came down one time. I had the angle on him. He dunked the ball so bad, the ball hit me in the top of the head. My teeth fell out on the ground. The crowd roared. I had scrambled to grab him off the ground and put him back in my mouth. That helped build his reputation. A Julius solo le quedaba una cosa por hacer en Rucker. They would call him different names, uh, Little Hawk. He went over to the announcer and said, I'm not the Little Hawk. That's Connie Hawk. So then they called him the Claw. Oh, man, the Claw's got the ball going. I was like, I'm thinking, I wonder who he's talking about. He's calling me the Claw. I didn't want to be the Claw. They would call him all sorts of names. Oh, what a rebound by Black Moses. Black Moses, what are you talking about? He said, if you want to call me anything, call me the doctor. So you know, they said, well, the doctor is operating tonight. <laughs> All of a sudden, Dr. J, Dr. J, Dr. J. Who's your favorite basketball player? Dr. J. Why? All his moves he do, that's why. Behind me, up on the roof, is a school. They were all on the roof. He drew the greatest crowd in the history of the Rucker Pro League. You had people up in the trees, sitting on branches. Everywhere you looked around, there were people. It wasn't even standing room only. People could not see enough of the game. We had people on the bridges. This is where the legend of Dr. J started. Era 1971. Cuatro años después, la calidad del baloncesto de Playground había crecido, aunque no tenía nada que ver con un partido de la NBA. Pero la reciente ABA, fundada en 1967, era una historia completamente diferente. We played that street kind of ball, you know, where we pushing it up. Guys get up in the air, they like, oh, let me change it, put it around here. Let me do some of this. Yeah, bam. <laughs> we were entertaining. You know, we come down, dunk on you, you know, come down, and make a tricky move. We're playing in a league that endorses discovery. And there, my friends, is the very dramatic brand of basketball which can be enjoyed only in the ABA. We always felt the NBA was that old slowdown ball. They come out, run plays, I mean, you know, come on, man, who wants to see that? It was like the NBA was ashamed of dunking, and the ABA embraced it. There wasn't anything like this, and if you loved basketball, you had to love this. The ABA would take anybody. If you were an eighth grader and they thought you could play, they'd sign you up. Un dueño desesperado en una liga desesperada había llevado a los juniors de la Universidad de Massachusetts de la nada a cambiar la liga para Rucker. 
I was in New York for an ABA meeting, and they mentioned the fact that there was this player up in New England that was so spectacular, Julius Irving, and I'd never heard of him. And they proceeded to extol all the virtues of how great he'd be in professional basketball. And with that conversation, I moved forward to see if I could sign him to a contract. At this time, I didn't even know who the Virginia Squires were. But my mother probably made six to $8,000 a year, and I was being offered $125,000 guaranteed for four years. And the rest was history. Dentro del mundo del baloncesto, Julius Erwin era un joven y atlético, proyecto de jugador y poco más. Pero el Dr. J había encontrado el lugar perfecto para dar una nueva dimensión a su juego. He was just shackled. And the minute he got to the ABA, he just... Wow! Dr. J! Oh, super effort. I developed my own style of play, which is a playground style. It's real loose, a real freelance style. There's the man, Julius Irving. I thought I knew Julius Irving as a basketball player. And then I went and watched some guy they called Dr. J. I never saw this guy before. And there is Julius Irving. Look at that move behind the back. Oh! All of a sudden, he, uh, he's coming in off the foul line. He's coming in off the wings. He's dunking backwards. It was like watching two different players. Incluso en la más libre ABA, el Dr. J deslumbró. Pero si no estabas en el pabellón para presenciarlo, seguramente no le hayas visto en acción. You'd hear that, you know, this guy playing for some team in Virginia, the Squires, was flying through the air. And you're like, what? It was, who is he? Most of what we knew about him came from game stories, box scores, maybe a tiny film clip of a given play, and word of mouth. The games just were not televised. My brother was in the Navy in Virginia, and he kept telling me, this kid Irvin, man, he's a bad boy. I kept getting newspapers sent to me about this great kid named Julius Irving, who was scoring 28, 29 points a game. And I thought to myself, Julius Irving, finally a great Jewish basketball player. You're hearing these reports, this spectacular, swooping, out of nowhere guy that is just doing things that have never been seen before. Incluso la NBA tomó nota y fueron decididamente a por él para hacer un cambio. Algo que la ABA no podía permitir que ocurriese. Así que después de dos años en Virginia, el propietario de Virginia, El Foremon, sabía lo que tenía que hacer. I was as much concerned with his playing for the ABA almost as I was with his playing for the Squires. And I contacted the owner of the Nets and worked out an arrangement. In 1973, Foremon vendió al máximo anotador de la liga a los New York Nets. I was in Ocean City, Maryland. I got a call and I said, God, I got to go back to New York, man. I just on vacation with my kids and family. And he said, well, I said, what's going on? Well, we just got Dr. J. I said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. La gran estrella de la ABA afrontaba su etapa más importante. Julius Irving se iba a casa, a Long Island. New York has always been my home, and I'm very pleased and happy that I'll be able to play out my career here. This is New York, Long Island's Nassau Coliseum, home of the Nets. It's past the buck night here. A $5.50 ticket for only a buck. It's also bread night, a free loaf of bread for every fan. But there are only 9,300 fans who pass the buck here. 9,300 fans to see the second place Nets. 9,300 fans, $9,300 to see the fabulous Julius Irving, the great Dr. J. Coming back to Long Island, Life could not have been better. I mean, it was such great anticipation coming to play basketball in the place where I was born and raised. This building was brand spanking new. I mean, the identity of the Nets now is Brooklyn. But, you know, my time here and my era here, I think was very, very special.
El doctor debutó en Nueva York en octubre de 1973. Inmediatamente convirtió al equipo de su ciudad natal en un aspirante, haciéndolo todo con un estilo que solo puede definirse con una palabra. Cool. Dr. J was the epitome of cool. If you look up the definition of cool in the 1970s, it says see Julia serving. And it starts with the afro. It'd be up there so high. That fro used to, you know, kind of like fly in the back. Dr. J wasn't just the coolest man in the building. He was the coolest man in the area code, in the state, in the time zone, in the country. The thing that was so cool about Doc was the size of his hands. His hands are so big that when he holds a ball, it's like him holding a tennis ball. If you went up and tried to block it, I mean, he'd just move it over here and slam it down. So he could do anything with it. And when he would cradle the ball and be like this on a poster, there'd be a, the face sort of went with it. And if you can get the hair up like that at the same time, he was terrifyingly good. Man, I can't believe that dog. I've never seen one like it. He became a cult figure. Everywhere we went, all they wanted to do was see Julius. If you came to see him play, you was gonna leave there shaking your head saying, man, that kid flat out play. Go on, Doc. I played for a coach who said, you know what? We got this game plan, and it ain't working. <laughs> you need to do something. <laughs> Here's the doctor. We're playing Kentucky, and Dr. J's on a fast break. And Artis Gilmore, it's a mano a mano. He's waiting for Doc. Now, Gilmore, for people that don't know, is seven foot two with a five foot afro. Doc flew right over him. Gilmore's there. The Doc dunks it. What a play. Whether I was bringing the ball up court or getting it off the board, I was going to determine the outcome of the game. Irving with the basketball inside the half court line goes up. It's a 40 footer and it's all En su primera temporada jugando a pocas millas del lugar donde había crecido, el Dr. J ganó el título de máximo anotador y su primer MVP. Además llevó a los Nets a ganar su primer campeonato. Era el rey de lava y también tenía éxito fuera de la cancha. It was a beautiful time. I mean, I have a wife and I have two sons. And I'm very happy, very excited about the prospects for the future with a woman who I adore and who I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And basketball seemed to be taking care of itself. La siguiente temporada trajo otro trofeo de MVP y el doctor siguió creciendo. Pero el entorno de la liga tenía problemas para subsistir. It was always that challenge of being the other league not having the major television contract, not getting the notoriety. We were the NBA. We had the greatest franchises. We had the greatest players. The ABA was good basketball. It was fun basketball, but it wasn't the NBA. Se cumplía casi una década de guerra entre las dos ligas y la ABA estaba perdiendo. By 1975, the American Basketball Association was a little bit like the Titanic after it hit the iceberg kind of listing to the left and taking on water. There was a race. One that had the fastest car was probably going to get their checks cash first. As soon as they gave you a check, you rushed to the bank to make sure that the check was clear. We played the Utah one night, and uh, we've got to go to San Diego to play the next night, and all of a sudden, we can't go because San Diego folded. The ABA needs a profitable network television contract. It can't get that as the league now exists without merging with the NBA. So that means the alternatives for this league is consolidation or collapse. A veces parecía que lo único que seguía con vida en lava era su ilustre estrella. No matter how tired he was, he always had time for any reporter, anybody that wanted part of his time, he had time for them. He understood and felt the obligation that he had to try to help keep this league afloat. Y lo más memorable que hizo el doctor llegó en el fin de semana de las estrellas de 1976. Lava había ideado un plan perfectamente adecuado para sus características. Good evening, everyone. This huge record-breaking crowd here at McNichols Arena. 
about to bear witness to one of the most spectacular events in professional basketball, the slam dunk contest. El concurso incluía los mejores voladores de la liga, pero incluso ellos sabían que solo había un jugador al que ver. For the New York Nets, the fabulous Dr. J. Julius Irving. I was going up against Doc. I ain't have a chance. I knew I had a chance. And now the doctor goes to work. Unbelievable. Con cada mate el espectáculo mejoraba y los mejores se convertirían en parte de la historia del baloncesto. Dr. J measured off from the foul line, then went back to midcourt. I didn't know what he was going to do to be honest with you. He took off running with those short shorts <laughs> and his afro was blowing in the wind. Just before the free throw line, he takes off and bam. And that's that everyone really. Julius Irving. Before that, no one had seen that. First came the stunned silence, the gasp of disbelief, and then the roar of approval. And the winner, Julius Irving. It was bigger than I think what anybody thought it was going to be. You know, because 2013, we're still talking about it. So now how special was that? Pero en aquella temporada de 1976, Lava estaba dando sus últimos pasos, compuesta por entonces por solo siete equipos. Pero el Dr. J todavía volaba obteniendo su tercer título de máximo anotador, su tercer MVP, llevando a la final de nuevo a los Nets. Allí se enfrentaban a los talentosos Denver Nuggets. We had four great players. We had Dan Issel, Bobby Jones, Ralph Simpson, Marvin Webster, myself. But they had Dr. J. He gets it over to the doctor. Tie ball game. Here's a shot, Julius. He scores! He scores! He scores at the buzzer, and the Nets win. Julius Serving finishes up with 45 points and a shot stun crowd. Dr. J was amazing. Bobby Jones was the greatest defensive player ever to play the game, and Dr. J had his way. There is Julius Serving, and he has been a take charge guy. We knew where the ball had to go, and but no one had a problem with it. He just played tremendous. Look at Julius! Oh my goodness! He averaged almost 40 points a game, 15 rebounds, a lot of assists. He was really the difference in that series. The ball over! The ball! And the crowd storms out of the court! Pandemonium as the New York Nets win, 112 106. Everybody's hugging, and he poured champagne all over my head. Oh, it was just, it was just a tremendous celebration. It's as sweet as it ever was, I tell you. Now, hopefully, this is, we've started something and we can keep on winning some more championships in the years to come. But we're going to enjoy this one right now. Have a little champagne. <laughs> Good party. <laughs> then it was done. Then it was done. Let me say good morning to everybody. How are you doing? I'm Julius Irving. Haven't been in this building in a long time, but uh, it's kind of nice to be here. En el verano de 1976, las dos ligas profesionales de baloncesto al fin se unieron y la NBA absorbió las cuatro franquicias de lava, incluidos los New York Nets. Sin embargo, en un giro cruel de la historia. El propietario de los Nets, Roy Bow, debía a la nueva competición millones de dólares y no pudo retener a la superestrella que había mantenido vivos a su equipo y a la propia liga. I kept telling Roy Bow, you can't do this. I mean, you know, you, we're never going to be able to replace this guy. It's like selling Babe Ruth to the Yankees. I called Billy Melchioni and I did ask him, uh, is Julius Irving available? And Billy said no. Two weeks later, Billy called back and he said, Julius Irving is available. I immediately called our new owner, F. Eugene Dixon, and he said, tell me, Pat, who is Julius Irving? I said, well, let me just describe him as the Babe Ruth of basketball. Julius, I welcome with open arms the Philadelphia Kings. Thank you very much. My pleasure to be here. Great to have you with us. El doctor por fin había llegado a la NBA, aunque los jugadores profesionales habían vivido sin duda tiempos mejores. En 1976, necesitábamos ayuda. 
the two leagues had battered each other to pieces and it, it, you know the league was not healthy. Tras la dinastía de los Celtics en los 60 y las grandes estrellas a principios de los 70, el baloncesto parecía tener una buena base, pero por el contrario, la percepción del deporte cambió por completo. The league was viewed as having too many African Americans being at the heart of drug issues, players being overpaid. In the 70s people were afraid of all these things. White folks didn't know what to make of it. And sponsors didn't know what to make of it. Do I want to be associating my brand with this? Y además, llegaba un nuevo grupo de jugadores con la esencia del baloncesto callejero. Letting in the sideshow of the ABA. Our business may have been bad, but the stubborn fans of the NBA said, well, we don't need those guys because they're not playing a real brand of basketball. Sin embargo, había una curiosidad innegable en torno al debut de la mayor estrella de todas. I want to see Julius Irving more than I'd ever wanted to see any athlete in my life. Because you'd heard so much. And he was supposed to be so different. I think everybody was saying, show us. Show us. How good are you really? Desde la Universidad de Massachusetts a Rocker Park, de Virginia a Long Island, las proezas del Dr. J habían sido leyendas más que otra cosa. Y ahora en Filadelfia iban a comprobar si era una realidad. Where did this guy come from? <laughs> you know, look at what he does out on the court. My God, you know, there was nobody like him. That's incredible. Doc is bad. Julius was like that bird coming in on the wing, swooping in, dunking on people. It was just something to see. The doctor with his magic show. When you finally got to see this guy play, it felt like someone was giving you a gift. And Julius swoops to the middle. Oh my gosh. Did he just do that? Really, did he just do that? I'm guarding him, and we were in Philadelphia at the time. There's the doctor, everybody up in the spectrum. All of a sudden, I see 18,000 people start to rise to their feet, and I'm thinking, like, oh, something bad is about to happen here. <laughs> can go for the tie now. Irving maneuvers in. Julius has got it. You would go back in high school and college and tell your teammate, Did you see Dr. J yesterday? You didn't even remember what the score was. Did you see the moves that he put on? Doc just picked the ball up with one hand without even touching it with the other one. And windmill just hit the ball. Like, like his arms stretched from over here all the way like a rubber band. Boom! The crowd went crazy. Me and Dad Dawkins over there. Oh my! Oh, did you? we knew it was basketball then. Hey, have you ever seen anyone better than him? No, I haven't. He was the first guy I ever saw with air brakes. Air brakes. He was going to the basket straight, and all of a sudden he said, "It's start going sideways." How did he do that? I was like, you know, somewhat like a girl. Oh! La NBA no había visto un jugador como el Dr. J o un equipo como los 76ers que incluían también a George McGuinness, a Doug Collins y un par de jóvenes algo inconscientes y jugaban todos como estrellas. There will be three who never met a shot he didn't like. And here I am, you give it to me, I'm shooting it. When I was team, first guy got it, shot it. We play street ball. They are the Philadelphia 76ers, the greatest collection of individual talent ever assembled on one basketball team. E iba a ser el jugador de más talento de todos quien cambiase su juego por el bien del equipo. Pat Williams, who was the GM, clearly said, look, we're going to be a better team. We don't need a guy to score 30 every night. We don't need a guy to 
dominate every night. We got stars on our team, and I accepted that. So many people ask, when will the real Dr. J show? So it doesn't bother you, the two guys you beat out in scoring in the ABA, Gervin and Thompson, have now passed you in the NBA. Well, the scoring is an individual statistic, and I think the objectives of the team are the things that have to be paramount and have to come first. He didn't want to rock the boat. He was too nice a man to say, hey, I'm Dr. J, you know. Pero funcionó. Y los Sixers llegaron a las finales de la NBA ante un equipo que representaba todo lo contrario, los Portland Trail Blazers. We represented the team game, making the other people better. The 1977 finals were, were uh, almost a morality play in the eyes of a lot of people. This was the basketball world, the old world, taking a stand against these invaders and protecting the women and children from these, from these crazy people. Y en el comienzo de la serie, fue mejor esconder a los hombres y los niños. El doctor emergió para demostrar al mundo del baloncesto quién era el mejor jugador de una vez por todas. El concepto de equipo de Portland parecía no encontrar respuesta al talento individual de Irving. Y el doctor coloca a los Sixers 2 a 0 arriba en la serie. Pero a finales del segundo duelo, todo cambió. There was a division created by that fight, and Portland used it as a rallying cry. Portland pulled together, and we pulled apart. Portland knew how to wait for the guy to come off. Pass the ball. Another great pass by Wallace. Where we were, hey man, get over there and get the ball. What's wrong with you? I ain't passing you no more. It was, it was a big difference. Los Blazers se repusieron y se llevaron los tres siguientes partidos. Entonces los Sixers, casi en la lona, estaban al borde del abismo en el sexto partido. Y el doctor respondió con una actuación de leyenda. Con 40 puntos, Irving lideró a los Sixers toda la noche, aunque en los últimos segundos necesitaban una canasta para lograr el empate. We go to the huddle and, you know, guys are saying that they can beat their man. El técnico de Philly, Jen Shu, preparó la última jugada para George McGuinness. When the game comes down to the very end, how can you not get the freaking ball in his hands? When the game was over, the doc said, uh, I'm going over there to the other room and congratulate them guys. And I looked at Darryl like, well, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm like, did you say you can go over there and congratulate these guys? <laughs> I said, I want to go over there and fight. And he said, yeah, we're, we're going to go over there, you know, and congratulate these guys. And we did. We did. Incluso en la derrota. La actuación de Irving fue inolvidable. Even though the Trailblazers won that series, by the time that finals was played, Julius Irving was the star of the NBA. Y durante el resto de los 70, esa estrella brilló más que nunca. Every time he came to town, that was the game to be at, the game where Julius Irving was playing. Playing against Dr. J. Just what's Dr. Irving? 
story about Dr. J. He's taking his team all the way. He leads them through the NBA's... You know, when a phenomenon happens, a phenomenon happens. It seemed like every Sunday you were on national TV playing somebody because people wanted to see the doctor. He was carrying the weight of the league on his shoulder. He realized he was an ambassador for the league. He was the ultimate ambassador for the league. The NBA supports Special Olympics. Why don't you? He was so senatorial. He was so gracious. There was nobody like the man known as Dr. J. Even as great as he is now, he's going to be greater. <laughs> Julius. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> Appreciate that. It was always like Julius was so cool. The language was like, you know, indubitably. These rings are significant because they represent important associations. I remember I was so happy as a young black man who cared about language and presentation and image that Julius Irving sounded the way he sounded. Say, hey, Dr. J, where'd you get those moves? You move with such grace. Are you a member of the human race? Major corporations decided that they wanted this guy to endorse their product. The idea that a black guy would be the face of a national brand, that was really radical. Tras años de un estrellato algo clandestino, la popularidad del Dr. J explotó con una declaración universal sin precedentes. I remember a lady saying, I would want my kids to grow up and be like the doc. And these were white people, they were, you know, dark blacker than me. You know what I mean? These were white people. They were like, I want my kids to grow up and be like this man. And I was like, wow, man, that's, that's, that's some serious stuff right there. A principios de los 80, el viaje que había comenzado en un complejo de viviendas de Long Island ya había guiado a Julius Ervin a una mansión de Filadelfia. Él y su mujer Turquoise ya tenían cuatro hijos, al dar la bienvenida a su hija Jasmine y a su hijo Corey a la familia. We're having a lot of discussion in our house about, you know, the Kennedys who we admired. And from an African-American perspective, I mean, we wanted to be that type of family. And we were on what I thought was a pretty good course. Julius era un ejemplo para cualquier jugador. Y cuando las mejores estrellas universitarias del país querían algún consejo, solo había una persona con la que hablar. I got him on the phone. I said, I'm trying to turn pro, thinking about it. You know, what's the pros and cons? And he said, look, come on out to Philly and you can stay with me for the weekend. And I'm like, what? So I couldn't wait to get off the phone telling all my friends, I'm going to Philly. I'm going to stay at Dr. J's house. De nuevo en la pista, el Dr. J era ya el capitán de unos Sixers que habían reconstruido el equipo en torno a él. Y aunque sin su peinado afro, seguía jugando. ¿Y de qué forma? En 1980, los Sixers regresaron a la final para medirse a Los Ángeles Lakers y al invitado de aquel fin de semana en casa del doctor. El doctor estaba en forma y los Sixers lograron repartir victorias en los cuatro primeros partidos, logrando una actuación espectacular en los últimos compases del cuarto encuentro. Magic and I were sitting there, and we were sitting right on the baseline. And when Dr. J left his feet, he didn't know what he was going to do. When we cut him off baseline, he started walking in there, got the ball in one hand. And we said, wait a minute, he's got to come down. There's no way he can stay in the air that long. 84 Sixers, and they get inside. Cooper and I said, oh. should we ask him to do it again? We've never seen anything like that before. It was crazy. 
I didn't realize how long I had been in the air, but I knew I didn't have any legs left, but I didn't have any hang time left, so I fell on the floor. <laughs> Just another move. Julius volvía a dejar su sello, pero noches más tarde, de vuelta en Filadelfia, iba a ser Magic el que eclipsase al doctor en un sexto y decisivo partido. Magic played every position, and they won a road game in Philadelphia that broke our hearts. From the time Julius arrived in Philadelphia, any year we didn't win a title uh, was a failure. 1980 supuso la cuarta temporada con Julius y sin un campeonato. How many more IOUs are out there? We owed you one, we owed you two. When the hell are they going to win something here? En 1981, el doctor fue el MVP de la liga, pero volvió a caer en playoffs, esta vez ante Larry Bird y los Celtics. The one thing that eluded Julius was winning a championship in the NBA, and here he was, uh, now taking a back seat to Magic Johnson out in Los Angeles and Larry Bird up in Boston. So many would say, well, you won an ABA, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. That was a minor league. You got to win over here. At the end of the day, if you win a championship as an NBA player, it's on your chest forever. If you don't, you're always viewed as not quite a champion. En 1982, los Sixers volvieron con Julius de nuevo a la final y de nuevo perdieron ante los Lakers. The Lakers are the world champions. There's only so many times you can get near the top of the mountain and then not get over. Because if you're the man, you have got to be the man and overcome everything. There was great doubt that Julius would ever get it done. A lot of folks around the league began to say, great star, not going to win a championship. I had a sense that the window was closing and there's nobody to blame. You look in the mirror first, you say, what could I have done differently? Pero había otra visión sobre la falta de títulos del Dr. J. Y no le culpaba a él ni a su juego. It's not how good you are, it's how good your team is. And Dr. J's team just wasn't good enough. One of the things that, you know, we learned and, and that Boston obviously learned is that every single year you got to complement your stars by getting other players. I mean, you can't just have one guy. You know, he needed a little bit of help. They needed to get somebody with Julius. And they got the right man at the right time. A fellow by the name of Moses Malone. Al igual que Julius, Moses había comenzado en lava y ahora esa fuerza interior iba a ser el compañero del doctor en otra lucha por el título. In thinking about Moses, um, that's a dimension that I've never played with in a 12 year career. They just complemented each other's talents so well. Julius, a dump off to Moses Malone, who bullies his way to the hall. In the temporada 82-83, the Sixers conseguieron de lejos el mejor balance de la liga. That goes up and champs it again. If they won by 25, it was a bad night, and I mean, just crushing teams. Y mientras Moses Malone acababa como máximo anotador de Filadelfia, el Dr. J seguía protagonizando las mejores jugadas. Nada iba a ser tan recordado como ese contragolpe ante Los Ángeles en el tramo final de temporada. I was there when he had that that famous dunk against the Lakers. Literally stole the ball right in front of me. He's going to be stolen by the doctor. Yes, he's got it. Here he comes. Ray rocks the baby to sleep and slam dunk. <laughs> and the doctor made a sensational play. I can't explain it. I mean, it was just like this intense release of emotion. It was incredible. It was one of those moments as a kid that's just tattooed in my in my memory. The doctor made a sensational play. He rocked the baby and what a sleep. When Dr. J broke down the sideline, I was like, okay, this is my chance to make a great play against a great player. 
But that didn't happen, so I just said, you know, let me duck my head and get out of the way. Cooper just ducked. The greatest dunk of all time. And you know what? If you're going to get dunked on by anyone, why not let it be the best in the game? Los Sixers y los Lakers se iban a medir de nuevo en las finales de la NBA. Y Philly, por una vez, no solo era el favorito, sino la elección sentimental de muchos aficionados. We had everybody against us. <laughs> the world was against us. I've never seen the country want to cheer for one guy. Because what he had meant to the league and what he had done for the game of basketball. No hubo en el juego demasiadas dudas. Y Doc y los Sixers barrieron a Los Ángeles. The Philadelphia 76ers finally the champion. It was such a relief. Like a brick that was sitting over your head waiting to hit you and suddenly went the other way. And now it wasn't there anymore. Let's all have a special nod to Dr. J. Julius Irving, this has to be a great, great night for him. So like the jubilation on his face, just like, like relief, just we did it, we finally did it. Even though we would have loved to beat him again, you know, we would have loved to keep him in that pain. No doubt. Clean all those skeletons out of there. Yeah, huh? yeah. But you give those who really deserve it their just due when it's time. There you go, Bill. I just remember I hugged him as tight as I've ever hugged anyone in my life. I was so happy for him. Because if there was ever a player that deserved to have that one little piece that he was missing for his legacy, he had it now. Por fin, Julius Erving era campeón de la NBA. It wasn't quite that easy. Because I've been trying to get here for seven years. Julius ya no era ese joven con el pelo alocado que cambió el juego. Tenía ya 33 años. Muchos para un jugador de baloncesto que pocas veces los aparentaba. Sin embargo, una nueva era ya había comenzado en la NBA y no iba a volver a optar a otro título. Y con el paso de los años, la única pregunta en la carrera de Julius Erving era... ¿Hasta cuándo durará? Y a finales de 1986, él mismo lo dejó claro. Quite simply, I've just notified the 76ers that I intend for this to be my last year in the NBA. And uh, one of the main reasons why was because I'm, I've been constantly asked this for the last three years. Ese tiempo dio a los seguidores y a los jugadores de la liga la oportunidad de mostrar su agradecimiento. We had to admire this man's athletic ability, and above and beyond all of that, the man's class. It was like being around royalty. An elder statesman type class, dignity. It was pretty cool. A most respected and admired adversary whose great skill and competitive play has entertained so many for so long on the Boston Parquet. Aunque ningún homenaje fue más emocionante que el que recibió de su antiguo equipo de lava. He was the ABA. He revitalized the NBA. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. J. El doctor J abandonaba el parque, pero incluso sin Julius Erving no hacía falta rebuscar mucho para acordarse de él. Aún así, el Julius Real se alejó de los focos. Con apariciones esporádicas y fue la siguiente generación de estrellas la que se acordó de él en muchas ocasiones.
I didn't know what to do. Then all of a sudden, I found the guy who started it all. Dr. J was sitting over there, he was looking at me, and he pointed, like going back and do the free throw line. El estilo moderno que el Dr. J impulsó evolucionó tras su retirada y se convirtió en un fenómeno global. Aunque Julius Erving volvió a protagonizar titulares en la primavera del 2000 y por un motivo que nadie hubiese imaginado. Nearly a month ago, Dr. J, Julius Erving's youngest son Corey, was missing. He went out to buy bread for a cookout and did not come back. How do you live with this every day, Julius? It's the parents' worst nightmare. Uh, this is day 26 for us. Basketball great Julius Irving is offering a reward for help in locating his 19-year-old son. Five weeks go by. You're helpless. It was controlling our lives. Uh, this was this was it. This was the only thing that mattered. I just want him to come home or somebody to let us know what happened to him. And we're holding on and hoping that um, it's going to turn up. Sad news this morning, a tragic discovery in Florida where authorities announced they believe they have recovered the body of basketball legend Julius Irving's missing son. Searchers found Corey Irving's car submerged in a pond near the Irving family home. There's a little deja vu. I lost my brother when I was 19. Now Corey was 19. Detectives say they believe the son of basketball legend Julius Irving simply took a fatal turn on his way home. It's like your guts are being ripped out. It's, it's an empty emptiness. It's the worst thing that ever happened in my life. The toll on our family was insurmountable. Insurmountable. Everybody dealt with it differently. And I think the way that my dad deals with most things in his life is the way that he dealt with my brother passing, in that you've got to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and carry on with life. And my mom wasn't prepared to do that. It became very, very difficult for us to relate to one another after that fact. And it wasn't a long period of time before we went our separate ways. I'm amazed when I see people 40 and 50. They haven't lost anybody. <laughs> Obviously, I can't relate to that, but I might not be as strong an individual as I am and, and have had the ability to endure the hard times uh, without those tragedies having happened. but he has a positive spirit and energy. And as far as it relates to that legacy that is him, that the whole world knows who I am and knows what I did. That's not how I function. To me, I mean, I like to keep the carrot out in front of me. I like to think that 
best day of my life, the best time of my life is, is yet to come. Echa un vistazo al espejo y mira hacia adelante. Todo el mundo le mira y echa la vista atrás. commentators and journalists talked about this guy, Dr. J. It was so much reverence. I'm like, I want to be Dr. B. You know, I was a kid, but I don't know that I'd be Dr. Boy today were it not for Dr. J. You rock the baby and put it to sleep. Your hero is someone who inspires you. I look at that dunk. My wife thinks I'm crazy because I start to get a little teary-eyed. She's like, you're crazy. I go, this is, this is what has helped me, you know, achieve what I've achieved growing up in Philly and watching the great Dr. J. Everyone's got highlights. But after all of these years, you still go, wow. Who could have told that he would become one of the greatest players and people to ever step onto a basketball court? And will always be, no matter who comes behind him. That man is universally loved this magnificent performer who had the ultimate gift. He made people happy. He helped young players like Larry and I understand that we had to be more than just a basketball player. When greatness meets class, that's what God created in Dr. J. I think he changed the game in ways that a lot of people don't really talk about. The simple fact, if you ever hear Michael Jordan talk, he always said he looked up and aspired to be like Dr. J. So if there's no Dr. J, then, you know, Mike would have never had someone to look up to. And if there was no Mike, then, you know, it was guys like myself who looked up to Mike. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see much of Dr. J when I was a kid and really didn't see a true creative player that a lot of people have spoken about. But when he left the game, he left with a lot of class and a lot of dignity and, and that respect from the peers. And that's something that if I don't even win a world championship or MVP or whatever, uh, that is something I would love to walk away from the game and have. Hubo un tiempo en el baloncesto, no hace tanto donde no se podía ver al mejor jugador del mundo noche tras noche y donde las noticias llegaban a cualquier lugar del planeta a través de las historias que se transmitían de una generación a otra. Por eso es importante mantener viva la historia más grande de aquella época. Para que la leyenda pueda vivir para siempre.